happy to. Thanks, Harold. Glad to be here to with you. It was good to see the other night at Seth Farber's event. Well, that was a good event. You know, it they was. taped it, and then they, they found out the tape recorder wasn't working. Oh. I was going to make it into a pamphlet. Oh, God. Yeah. Wouldn't you know? That's too bad. Yeah. But anyways, and to see Daniel uh, uh, Berrigan. A know. saintly man. Absolutely. I mean, it was an honor to see yeah. the man. Anyway, I'm really happy, and I read your, I got a chance to look at your book there. Welcome very much to conversation. It's a pleasure, great, distinct pleasure to welcome to the program. Um, um, the author of these two books, or the co-author of these two books, and that being Michael Stephen Smith, is that it? Thanks for using my middle name. Yeah, and this is one of the books he co-authored with the great uh, Michael uh, Ratner, and also the daughter of the author of this book, which is William Kunstler. It's called, it is the, the Emerging Police State, and this is a really good read, and I thank you for having brought that out. He's also the author of another book here, Notebook of a 60s Lawyer, uh, and uh, Michael Smith. Uh, welcome very, very much to Conversations into Manhattan Network. Well, uh, thanks, Harold. I'm glad to be here. It's a great um, personal, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. You're a friend of uh, Bill Kunstler's and so was much of the world that I know and so forth, <laughs> and I thank you for all that. But uh, I wonder if you could, we've got time and we may be able to get a little rolled in pieces and footage and so forth, but could you share a little bit of your own background, your own personal background, where you were born and raised, that sort of thing, and then we can get into what it's been like being a lawyer in the 60s and other matters of the human condition, but your own background, please, if well, my, you would. My folks are from Chicago. Uh -huh. um, I think I was probably conceived uh, the night after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Really? Because I was born nine months after, uh -huh. and my dad enlisted in the Marine Corps. Uh -huh. So I was raised initially a little bit in Chicago, and then out in California where the Marines were stationed just south of San Diego. Uh -huh. And they shipped me back to Chicago to live with my grandparents behind their tailoring store. Uh -huh. My dad was still out there uh, in the Marines, yeah. and my mom was working at an aircraft plant uh, right. out there, yeah. the Rosie plant that built the, the uh, Spirit of St. Louis, uh -huh. uh, Lindbergh's plane. All right. Yeah. And my grandparents raised me for a couple of years. The uh -huh. war ended. My dad came back. My mom came back. Yeah. And we all moved up to Milwaukee. Uh -huh. So to answer your question, I was uh, raised really in Milwaukee, in a little uh, village just north of Milwaukee called Fox Point. Okay. And uh -huh. then went on to the University of Wisconsin uh, uh, in the Madison? 60s. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right. During the uh, great days at, at Wisconsin. Oh, I, I don't care what anybody says they were. As Bobby Dylan said, there was something blowing in the wind along about 68, 69. Well, at Wisconsin and yeah. Berkeley were like the two... Uh, most wonderful places. I got in there by luck. I wasn't uh -huh. much of a student, but uh -huh. if you graduated high school yeah. in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. you automatically got into the university, okay. unless you were a, not of good moral character. Uh -huh. Well, you and, know you're of good moral character. Well, that, my, no, principal, <laughs> my principal didn't agree and uh -huh. uh, refused to sign the application. I couldn't get into college, uh -huh. but the guidance officer at uh -huh. my high school uh, thought that I was not a person of bad moral turpitude, uh -huh. and uh, he forged, he was a Marine, the guidance uh -huh. counselor, uh -huh. and uh, for some reason he liked me, and he forged uh, the principal's name on the application in August, and I got into college in September. I'll be darned! Yeah, so that's how I got Isn't into college. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And so maybe we should go back and investigate what this principal was basing his APRA his, uh, you know, his thoughts about you upon, young man. What well, was it that you were? You know, was it heavy duty? You didn't have to do you know, time. It, I mean, it, it wasn't. It was. We weren't political. Hijinks, pranks. It was, yeah, it was hijinks yeah. and pranks. Right. Yeah, because we didn't really understand politically yet. Yeah, right. Uh, my my pals and I. Yeah. Um, it was like the jazz musicians at yeah. the time. You know, right. um, you know they they were rebels, but they were more cultural rebels than political rebels. Right. Right. And uh, we did a lot of hijinks. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, we were not good uh, high school students in the 50s in Milwaukee. You can imagine this yeah. Republican yeah. suburb. Yeah. Everybody was white. Everybody yeah. was wholesome. Yeah. Everybody yeah. wanted to be a scientist uh -huh. uh, or have 3.6 kids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we were reading Allen Ginsberg and, yeah. and going, stealing cars and going yeah. out to hear Lenny Bruce. I see. Yeah, right, um, right, right, right. I think the prank that, uh -huh. uh, that turned the principal against me definitively uh -huh. was we snuck out of school and went down to the poultry market downtown and I bought a goose uh -huh. and we came back and we got into class uh -huh. and uh, my pal was sitting in the back mm -hmm. with a whistle uh -huh. and another person was sitting in the middle with a cap gun uh -huh. and I was in the front with the goose. Uh -huh. a, a live goose? Or? That no, was dead, dead but it had goose. feathers yeah, right. on it. I was just wondering, yeah. Had and, feathers, uh, had feathers. Uh, one guy, feathers had feathers, goose. yeah. Oh, okay. Got it from the poultry market. In those days, yeah. you could buy a... Oh, well, yeah, a, a feathered yeah. goose, yeah. 
and the guy blows the uh, yeah. goose yeah. whistle. Uh -huh. And uh, I threw the goose at the teacher, <laughs> and the other guy stood up with the cap gun and shot it. <laughs> <laughs> Got Abby Hoffman, yeah? Yeah, yeah right, right, um, right. And, and uh, on these little, these little interpretations, they didn't want to let you into university, well, it was but more, you got it done, right? More than a few. Yeah. Uh, I finally got in. I had no idea what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, like Bruce, you really did at that time? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was something Oh, else, we adored him. It? Yeah. My, my friends and I, well, were pretty one night... conscious. He was very political. Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah, he was. We yeah. were about in at, the best at sense that of level. the word. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We were sitting there, you know, looking yeah. up at him. Yeah. And uh, you know, we're all like 17 years yeah, old right. in Milwaukee at 6:30. Right. They started the nightclub at 6:30. Right. Get a whole routine about that. <laughs> you got to get we're looking, we're the only people in the audience. A reasonable hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, and, uh, yeah. But uh, uh, Wisconsin was a was a, a place where one could learn. Uh, how the world really oh, worked. Oh, Madison's a serious uh, school. Yeah. It was really active during the 60s. You know, all that Vietnam stuff was coming along then. I was the, what uh, year did you get into Madison? 1960. 1960. And then I, oh, okay, then yeah. I went to law school to, yeah. to get out of uh, the draft. Yeah. Um, was that Madison also? I went to NYU, and, and why, but I ran oh, out of money. New York. Yeah. My yeah. father had two other kids in college at yeah. the time. So I had the drop out and went back to Wisconsin. Yeah. And then at that, at, by that time, I... I I was politically active. I was around SDS. Initially, uh, I was the head of the Madison Committee on the War in Vietnam for a uh -huh. summer. Uh, I did some GI civil liberties support work in Madison. Did you help get the uh, SDS going with Tom Hayden and that? Or yeah, your own statement I, and all that stuff? When or the Port Huron statement out came out, it, yeah. no, I read it when it came out uh -huh. and I agreed with it. Uh -huh. um, but I found myself getting politically uh, past that. If I may uh, submit, when you were throwing that goose in the air, you were being political. <laughs> you know, well, saying, you know that was a political <laughs> thing along the line of what they call them, the yippies, right? You were sort of a, that is a legitimate consciousness that is political. But anyway, you said you got political, serious SDS kind of political. Well, initially, and, yeah. initially, and then, uh, you know, SDS uh, organized a great demonstration in Washington, the first one in 1965. 65 was early. Uh, yeah, that is early. You were, the, you were there? No, I was taking exams at yeah. NYU Law School, uh -huh. but I knew about it. I supported it. Uh -huh. And when I got to Wisconsin a couple months later, yeah. then I started. I was there in 67. Uh -huh. Yeah, I heard, 67. Uh, yeah, that's when I, heard, I caught up with uh, it, yeah. I heard John Lennon sing Give Peace a Chance yeah. in 67. You were no, there, too? No, no. Not in Washington? Yeah, yeah. No, I wasn't there. Is that yeah. when you, they tried to levitate the Pentagon? That's right. That was 67? That's right. Yeah. Oh, God bless Yeah, just like the French Revolution, yeah. the yeah, slogan right. was the bread is yeah. rising. Right. Their slogan was the Pentagon is rising. Right, right. You know? yeah, it's funny. They, <laughs> yeah. There was a great funny kind of thing. Ginsburg was such a beautiful figure. And Abby was wonderful. Yeah. Knew Abby pretty well. Did he you? was a great, yeah. Not real well, but real. Joanne, I know. Yeah, and I know everybody. Joanna, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he did a program with him. He was just coming up from underground. And we had to go do a program with him, with Abby. And uh, they turned off his electricity. We had to bring we had to bring the the the, the power in from the apartment above out the window <laughs> in the window to light all the equipment. It was funny. It was funny. Yeah. My brother-in-law yeah. Eddie Elson yeah. uh, was a figure not unlike Abby yeah. in Madison. Uh -huh. I was in law school with there him. Probably a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. And he did some funny stuff too. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a 19-foot banana in his backyard with feet. holes in the skins, and uh -huh. he, he called a press conference, and he had all the press come out, and he said, "You know, that banana is a model of the universe, uh -huh. Uh -huh. because just at night when you look out and yeah. you see the stars, yeah. we're actually looking through the holes in the skin around the globe." And that banana is just like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and they all wrote it down. And they're all writing it down, writing and it down. And then there, the uh, uh, Comet Kahootek. Yeah, I remember, you remember that. that? Yeah, it's a long time well, ago. Well, my brother-in-law yeah. sold yeah. tickets for a ride on it uh -huh. over the radio, wow. and he sold th thousands of people sent in money uh, to get a ticket for the Comet Kahootek. To watch and, it? You no, to, to get a ride on to it. To get a ride on it. And, and that then, guy was a super salesman. Yeah, uh, it was. A, yeah, he yeah. was. Yeah. And and. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then he was told that this was fraud and you could mm. get, you in get, trouble. get in trouble. And they had to send man. back all the money. Oh, dear me. <laughs> but, How disappointing. The funniest thing he did uh. in Madison is he ran for district attorney uh -huh. on the slogan of obey only good laws. Oh, boy. And he called a press conference mm -hmm. at the Dangle, which mm -hmm. was a topless club, yeah. at a big table. Uh -huh. And on one side of him, he had a suit of armor. Yeah. And on the other side is my sister, Patty, who's very beautiful. Yeah. 
And Eddie sat in the middle uh -huh. and hosted the press conference when he announced that he was running for district attorney, yeah. stark naked. <laughs> <laughs> stark at the, naked? At the dangle. I'll be at the dangle. That yeah. is funny. Yeah. Under the slogan, yeah. obey only good laws. Oh, obey. That's good. You know, yeah. that's all political. You know, I had my, I had, and, and political is, you know, some, you have that, remember, uh, Peter Townsend kicked Abby Hoffman off the stage at Woodstock because he was going to bring up Vietnam. Yeah. And it was a cultural thing, but it was there. But I had my sister's kids. They're dental surgeons. They came out here from uh, Missouri. But there's, there's professional people in their 30s. You know, they're kind of grown and everything. And everything. And they, they're friends and they're professional. And then she said none of them, none of them that they know in their 20s and that, ever watch the news on television, like we used to watch Mr. Cronkite over here. They never watch the news. They watch the comedy channel to yeah. get their sense of reality. Yeah. Because the world seems absurd. Yeah. And it seems like a big Beckett play or something. Yeah, yeah they so watch John Stewart the and the Daily Show John Stewart's uh, to brilliant. get the news. He's brilliant. Yeah. And Colbert yeah. coming along, he's brilliant. I but that's where they get their news and everything, yeah. and it's with a satirical bite. And comedy is really an important part of a sort of, in a sense, political context, but it's not dialectically organized. You're putting all the rational arguments together and what seems like a serious political thing is being done in a lighthearted way, but that's very politically important. That well, kind of humor is really important. I don't know if you intended it, but you know, I brought along a clip yeah. of a panel discussion that we had at the Social Scholars Conference right. in April of 2002, right after 9-11. Is that down at Manhattan College? At BMCC. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Civil Liberties was crashing then, yeah. uh, and we entitled the panel the same thing I entitled this book that, yeah. that I edited, uh, uh, The Emerging Police State, and yeah. that was the title of the panel. Yeah. And, uh, and I gave uh, an introduction to uh, what I thought was going on now yeah. um, by telling a story about Richard Nixon. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. so if, if that's well, what that we were leading into, we I brought along a clip of, of the uh, Richard Lynn Nixon Stewart bit. Was there? Yeah, or something? Well, yeah. Lynn Stewart had just been indicted. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, still, that's and, still there, right? She's there, and, and uh, the great uh, constitutional lawyer Len Weinglass yeah, was on right, the panel. Right. Michael, Ratner Michael Ratner from the Center Blessing, for Constitutional yeah. Rights was there. He co-edited the book about the emerging police state with you, I think, right? He wrote the introduction. Okay, yeah. Uh, I wrote the uh, biography of Bill. Uh -huh. And then we had a lot of stuff that we got from the FBI. Right. They were following him around taping his speeches. Wasn't Bill Kunz do something else, man? Oh, yeah. Were you at the memorial? You yeah, were. Course, I asked yeah. you that. Memorial service? Yeah, sure. St. John the Divine? Yeah. When yeah. Patty Smith sang a cappella among the stars. Yeah, well, that Man, was that I was one of his favorite it songs. Beautiful. It's a beautiful song. She's it's Kurt Vile's song. Is it? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. yeah, it was just a beautiful. Yeah, it was thing. it was a Broadway play actually. He was bigger than life, Bill Kunstler, and you you wrote yeah. you got his letters and and so forth. And anyway, so we've got a tape that was done at the Scholars Convention, and maybe we could set that up. We we should have it. it runs about five minutes or so. Yeah, set it up, Why and then let's talk about up? Bill when the tape is and done. And then we can talk about Bill and other matters because the civil liberties and the emerging of a police state seems to be still moving in many people's mind in that kind of a direction. It's picking up speed. Like picking up speed, if anything else. <laughs> they so abolished habeas corpus on Tuesday. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes right. Uh, yes, jails. Are there no jails? Are there no poor houses? You know? Anyway, so we're talking with uh, William Stephen Smith, and um, let's see if we can run that tape now then, please. It goes about five minutes or so. Okay, roll the tape now then, please, if you could. Well, then maybe it's going to take him a second to get it going. Um, times that I was out in California go. three weeks ago. Right, well, we got to. And we I was bit. looking for some political inspiration. I was visiting an old uh, friend and, and my former partner, uh, Jim Lafferty, who's active in the Lawyers Guild out there. And we decided to drive out to Yorba Linda, California. You know what's in Yorba Linda, California? <laughs> Richard Nixon's sorry, final resting place. <laughs> place where he was born, and the Richard Nixon Historical Library. We hear it? So we thought uh, if we went out there, maybe we could get some answers to these troubling yeah, political questions. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'd recommend it to everybody. We it's only an Nixon's hour south of Los uh, Angeles. Just we got hysterical. there, we were greeted at the door by a Pat Nixon look-alike dressed in red, white, and blue, <laughs> handing out color photographs George, of Pat mm -hmm. Nixon, Nancy Reagan, and Betty Ford. And it got okay. better, because every, every person that worked there was, was dressed and looked similarly. 
It's like the Stepford Wives, and you walk in there, and the first thing <laughs> that you get to is the gift shop. <laughs> so Where we went into it? the gift shop. It's about a third of the size of this room, oh, yeah. and I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that half of the merchandise, and you know, as Mel Brooks says, it's all about merchandising, half of the merchandise there are photographs of the day that Elvis met Nixon. <laughs> Beach towels, mm -hmm. beer mugs, shot glasses, pencils, <laughs> note papers, t-shirts, baseball hats. Mm -hmm. And I was staggered by this. Mm -hmm. and, and I went over to the manager of the store and I said, do you know that the day that Elvis met Nixon, Elvis was totally drugged out, and so was Nixon. Nixon was, <laughs> Nixon was popping Dilantin, which is an anti-seizure medicine that his friend Alfred Bloomingdale, who owns Bloomingdale's, recommended to him. And Elvis came and he presented Nixon with a silver pistol and seven bullets, and Nixon presented Elvis with a badge making him an officer in the war against drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, I, I recounted this story to the lady, and she said to me, you know, we all know that, that's why we sell this stuff. <laughs> so this inspired me to pursue Richard Nixon even further, and I read Anthony Summers' excellent biography called The Arrogance of Power. And in there you'll find a story about an interview with Nixon. The interviewer said to President Nixon, President Nixon, can you tell us the secret of your political success? And unhesitatingly, Nixon replied, fear. It's fear. You instill fear in people. And they don't teach you that in the Boy Scouts. <laughs> and that's, I think, very, very true. Um, it's, it's certainly true in, all, in the trials that Bill Kunstler recounts in this book that Michael and I are working on, um, bombings, the fear of bombings, uh, the Red Square scare uh, uh, during and after the First World War. Um, Tom Mooney, who was the head of the left wing of the labor movement in California, was indicted for a bombing. And they actually, in court, produced a photograph of Tom Mooney standing behind a clock at a street corner so you knew when and where he was at a certain time, which happened to be the time of the bombing, he was six blocks away, and they still convicted him. And it took 20 years to get him pardoned. Sacco and Vanzetti, also convicted against the weight of the evidence, also pardoned. The Rosenbergs, uh, also uh, convicted and executed uh, against, uh, well, there was some, there were, it was a hoax because there was some framed up evidence there, but it's clear now, historically, uh, that they had nothing to do with passing the secret of the atomic bomb, which the judge said caused the death of 50,000 people. It had nothing to do with that. Uh, and they uh, knowingly executed the mother of two children. Um, and that's the kind of results that this all-powerful government can get in a climate of fear. I just want to make uh, one reference uh, uh, to a law, which will give you an idea of, of where this panel is going, and, uh, and then I'll introduce uh, Clark. Uh, this law is not a law that you're going to find in the statute books of the state of New York, and it's not a law that appears in the federal laws either. It's a law that was formulated by a German philosopher about 150 years ago, talking about Hegel, and uh, it's a dialectical law. It's the kind of law that we can discuss here amongst comrades, uh, not the kind of law that we would discuss at the Trial Lawyers Association, but I think the kind of law that you would appreciate. Uh, and one of Hegel's uh, uh, principles of, of dialectics was that uh, quantity turns eventually into quality. That uh, something that's possible eventually becomes inevitable. You know, the, the Weimar Republic had a constitution that was the most democratic constitution in Europe. And 15 years later, they had Hitler. At a certain point, and I think the point was probably when the Nazis staged the burning of the Reichstag, the German parliament, at a certain point, the loss of liberties in Germany became irreversible. And I'm not saying that we have that situation in the United States. Clearly, we don't, or we wouldn't be meeting here. But we're moving in a direction where the 
police and the state are more and more intertwined and that we have less and less of a, a, a chance of organizing ourselves in their defense. Witness indicting a, an attorney uh, for representing a client. We're moving in that direction and that's the uh, outline of this panel. And each one of our panelists is going to speak about a picture of that. And I hope at the end of an hour, you'll get an idea of how the constriction of civil liberties has proceeded pretty quick in the last 25 years and very quick since after, after September 11th. Uh, the uh, agenda of, of the far right uh, was handed stuff on a silver platter after the attack on those buildings. And uh, they certainly took it up with respect to civil liberties. And that's what we're going to talk about. Clark is going to first give you an outline of how it went along. Well, a great deal has been said. OK, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, that's <laughs> really good. And it brought it right up, too, and everything uh, to the present. The erosion of civil liberties, which uh, is going apace, unfortunately. And a uh, number of things you brought up in there. I know I was, uh, you know, this thing, uh, David uh, Ray Griffiths thing. I went to see him talk the other day. And this 9-11 conspiracy stuff that's yeah. blowing in the wind now. I read his book. Caused me, yeah. caused me to go back and reread Shire about the burning of yeah, the yeah. Reichstag. Because I yeah, didn't yeah. remember whether or not that had been perpetrated consciously by the Nazis in order to inject fear into the German population. He said it did. Well, sure he did. And, and uh, <coughs> they were involved. One it wasn't of Kussler's that, speeches uh, uh -huh. that we reprint in the books about that. Yeah. yeah they, they, they consciously did it. Yeah, um, and used it, and they uh, used it, and they and I, I read, and then that caused me to read a lot more of Mr. Shar, and it went on that it was just chilling because it was just a uh, a steady erosion of the constitutional rights that had been built up, and it finally ended into got to a point where it was beyond any redemption, and the full the Nazi thing was uh, in full swing, yeah. and uh, a lot of these people are arguing that there was a hand in the uh, destruction of the World Trade Centers by people within the federal government of the United States of America, and nobody will touch that. Noam Chomsky won't even, uh, you know, Amy Goodman, they won't touch it because they think it's so absurd. But there's an awful lot of evidence that's beginning to grow that this current administration was involved in uh, shenanigans that was able to exploit the fear in order to build toward a fascistic kind of takeover of the government that seems to have happened uh, willy-nilly, but I just wonder. Those are a couple thoughts that I got yeah. going in my mind now. Well, I think you can. I think you can say this much, and I and I don't think there was a conspiracy on the part of the government to blow up those buildings. I don't think that's true. But I have an interesting story for you. Okay. I was representing several years ago a rabbi who was the rabbi up at Columbia University, and he was up doing grievance counseling in Harlem right after 9/11. He ran into Bill Clinton. Uh huh. He said to Clinton. Mr. President, the American government had to know about this. They had to know about it. Yeah. Because the next day, the pictures and bios of these guys flying the planes were in the New York Times. Yeah. Yeah. And Clinton said, you know, they did know about it in advance. But certain parts of the government don't talk to other parts of the government. Uh -huh. um, I, of course, they, they, there are elements the government knew about. It. The people that were involved in it had been involved with the United States in Afghanistan. Yeah, right. A lot of those people were trained by the United States in the United States. Yeah, including uh, Osama bin Laden was supported by the it United was a, States it was in a, Afghanistan anyway. It was a blowback was a, thing yeah. that happened. Right. Um, and that's what happens when you play with fire. Mm -hmm. But what I think you can say is this, that, that once those buildings were knocked over and all those people were murdered, mm -hmm. the Bush government, took full advantage of the fear that was engendered to enact their agenda, both here and abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, they brought forward this Patriot Act, 342 pages. Mm -hmm. In three weeks, they produced that in Congress and got it voted on. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was all kinds of stuff that had come up and been rejected before. They had collected it all, and they were waiting to uh -huh. use it. And they scared the pants off of Congress. They, Congress people voted for that thing without even reading nation, it, yeah, and right. then they were calling up the ACLU right. the next right. day to ask what they voted on. Right, 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 right. Uh, and the right. other thing that they yeah. that they had, 
on the shelf that they were able to take off right away mm -hmm. was their war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that well, from, that's been going from, since the from Richard Clark. Mr. Wolfenson has been involved in that since the 70s. Well, that, that was the, the neocons had yeah. issued a, a paper right. uh, with those designs. But Richard Clark, who was the head of uh, internal security and reported to the president, uh, was approached by Bush uh, right after 9-11. Mm -hmm. And he said, show me that Iraq did it. <coughs> and, and Clark said, I can't do that because mm -hmm. Iraq was not involved in this. Mm -hmm. And Bush said, show me that Iraq did it. Uh -huh. And they finally pushed him out of his position. Yeah, and he right. wrote that book. He right. went on a tour and so on. Uh -huh. They used that. Uh -huh. They scared the pants off the American people. Right. And they used and it to, still doing to it. Uh, facilitate their agenda right. uh, over there and here. They had an uh, ideological take on things from the beginning. And so on. I wonder if you could, have you go back to that thing about the Reichstag or Bill Kunstler's dealing with it or Mr. Shire and all that? Uh, William Shire and the rise and fall and that. Uh, the, 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 maybe we, we went over there. Uh, did the burning of the Reichstag was in March, I think, in 1933. There was an election coming up. He was voted, and, 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 and that there was a fellow went in there, and they burned the Reichstag, and the claim is that there were Nazi people who came in a tunnel and that they did it. There was well, they set guy, up this there was crazy front, young Dutchman. There was a front guy who was a commie, and he was an arsonist and a commie, and he burned a shirt or something, but that it was they who did it. And have you researched that at all? Was that the case that the Nazi party, which was coming to power, uh, knew or participated in that fire in order to generate fear and so forth? Were they consciously aware yes, precisely. of that? You precisely. You said that our government was not aware of what happened on 9-11. Um, I think uh, elements, I know, think I, elements I, of the know, government knew that these bad guys uh, we're up to something, but they didn't communicate with each other. Uh -huh. But but with respect to the I mean, it's one thing to the be burning. participant in the in the conscious pre-event, participating in knowledge of a thing that's going to take place, and taking advantage of something that other thing comes out of the blue and you well, take advantage of. Well, you know what I'm saying? That's the that's the distinction. Did Mr. Shire ever give us a good or others give us a picture? Were they consciously aware of that pre, or did they just the Nazis? No, the they, 33, or did they just take advantage of something? No, no. Or, how, how, do, how do you read that well, from your research, and what do you know? My, my research is pretty much limited to what I learned from reading uh, what Bill Kunstler researched okay. on it. And, what did he and find? That the Nazis put up this crazy Dutchman to do it, uh -huh. uh, and, then the, and then blamed it on the communists. You know, the Nazis were not doing that well at that point, but yeah. after the Reichstag fire, they went on to take, uh, because take power. Because you read Shire, and it happened just really quick. Yeah. All the constitutional rights and everything look, were just cut look, right away, and, they, and it was the commies that they were focusing now it's the terrorists, the Islamists. That's We're exactly, now focusing. That's so exactly there's a similarity the there. Now it's the terrorists and, and the Arabs and the Islamists. And you know, yeah. if another tragedy happens in this country, mm -hmm. we're right on the brink of losing everything. Oh, yeah. Uh, because yeah. my definition of a police state uh -huh. is when the executive branch, the presidency uh -huh. and the executive branch, have unlimited powers, that there's no checks and balances, that there's no stopping them. They can do what they want. Congress and, has been uh, supine. It yeah. seems to me, or they've been just absolutely just, you know, two billion, two trillion dollar tax cut for the wealthy and ABM and every treaty and everything. They've been doing nothing. Well, They're beginning to stir now, maybe, but there's been no opposition hardly at all. It seems to me yeah. very frustrating. Yeah. There's been no opposition to this almost like coup d'etat well, happened you know, in our country. You, you know, does it, it seem that way to you? <laughs> yeah, it does. It I does. was going to say, Kevin uh, Phillips, who yeah. was Reagan's speechwriter, yeah, right. uh, when asked to comment on the uh, efficacy of the Democratic Party, the yeah. so-called opposition yeah. said, and here's his definition of yeah. the Democratic Party, he yeah. said, it's the capitalist second favorite party. I see, yeah. Right. You know, so there's really not an opposition. Yeah. Uh, and I think it goes all the way back to when they destroyed the union movement beginning in the late 40s. Well. Um, and, and it's impossible uh, now Late we don't... 40s. Well, yeah. Yeah, you think so? Sure. Yeah. Uh, why do uh, I want to identify it with PAPCO and Reagan in 1980? Well, that they, ex they certainly accelerated it then. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But they they kicked right. out all the radicals from the union movement in the uh, late 40s. The radicals, you mean left-wing yeah. radicals? The, you the mean? people that had built the CIO, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. that had organized the movement uh, right. 
before and after the war. Mm -hmm. And looking back at it, in my view, mm -hmm. that was the that was a beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, we, nothing that nothing is is foreordained. But yeah, right. in in retrospect, mm -hmm. we don't have we don't have a labor party in this country. We don't have a socialist party in this country. It's gone. We don't the have a third oppositional party in this country. Is it true the left um, is gone? There is no, no. There's nothing left of the left. Or what do you think? I mean, a lot of people are saying there's nothing radical left anymore. The intellectuals are all falling down on the I job, and there's a, and the whole nation is supine before this. Yeah, I don't think that's. I don't think that's true. Okay. Uh, the demonstrations that were organized uh, uh, before the war and, and after the war were yeah. tremendous. Yeah, they were. I remember all during over the world during too, Vietnam. Yeah. yeah. It took us. We finally and the big demonstration that we talked about in mm. 1965 that yeah. SDS organized. Guess how many people were there? Twenty-five thousand. Six. Now, Sixty-five it took, was early. That's pretty early. Yes, yeah. but early in the yeah. opposition to the Iraq War. Yeah. yeah. Back in February, uh -huh. there were hundreds of thousands of people on the streets in New York, around the country. I'll there were millions were there. around the world, of course. Yeah. Remember that cold February day? It was a great day? night, right? It was, it was a great day. It was day. a great demonstration. Yeah. Um, and it was, again, all over the world. It really happened quick with the yeah. Internet. And there were, there and were 20 thing, some million people all around the world. And this movement thing might be able to find more and more of the folks or the people around the world that might be able to get wind of some sort of new change that would be called for maybe you know it can, no i think it's that's a great happening. recruiting thing. I, mean, I think that the the uh for the, folks. the uh morphology of the left if you will yeah. now is different than it was uh in the 50s and 60s mm. when we were young yeah but uh but it's there yeah uh, uh chase of boudin Leonard Boudin's grandson yeah, just Boudin. edited yeah. a book uh -huh. on uh, interviews mm -hmm. with uh, young rebels. Okay. It's wonderful to, re you mean to read. Currently, yeah. it, it just came out last week. Okay. Oh, it's good. wonder. It's wonderful to read it. Yeah. Uh, people are out there. Uh -huh. Stuff is happening. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can. You, you have to have an optimism of the will, yeah. even if you have some pessimism of the mind, yeah. or we're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. Um, you have to hope uh -huh. uh, that there's no worst case scenario. Uh, for example, uh, avian flu breaks out, and Bush uh, sends in the 101st Airborne, and uh, military occupies every city in the country, which yeah. is what he's talking about. Yeah. I mean, you have to hope that we have some breathing space, and that a new left mm -hmm. uh, will emerge and coalesce and give us what we really need, which is leadership. Uh -huh. And I think that's in formation now. Okay, we had a new left, and that, the left, and so then the left, and it was the commies that they were always after, and that sort of thing, McCarthy and all of that. But then you, you got to, so you don't cotton to the idea that, uh, what's his name, Fukuyami, Francis Fukuyami wrote the book, The, la the End of History. Were you the last kidding? man. <laughs> and he says it's all over. The Soviet Union and that whole idea of socialism where you can distribute according to need, put all the power in the government, get rid of a private sector, that is an idea that failed and has failed and that sort of thing. And that uh, the, 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 the ideological fight is over and the capitalists or the imperialists have won and get used to it, world. I don't, that's uh, you don't buy that. I don't cotton to that idea. You don't cotton to that. And idea. to use a folksy expression yeah. of my own, yeah. uh, I think uh, Chavez in Venezuela knocked that idea into a cocked hat. You think so? Because you now yeah. have uh -huh. a tremendous popular uh, movement going in the direction of socialism mm -hmm. in Venezuela, which mm -hmm. is a wealthy country, which mm -hmm. has oil, yeah. which can afford, uh, say, a literacy program so that in the last year a million and a half people have learned how to read and write. You uh -huh. can't have democracy without uh -huh. literacy, uh -huh. uh, which is uh, offering its oil to Caribbean countries, other Latin American countries, uh, which is setting up uh, a separate pole of attraction uh, from the Imperial North, uh, which is led by the United States. Uh -huh. um, so I think Fukuyama was dead wrong because you can't stop uh, the struggle that goes on between the rich and the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's gone on uh, throughout history, yeah. and it's going on now. But what you need uh -huh. is is a leadership that can guide it mm -hmm. and and eventually become the government. So Marxism, do you think Marxism is still alive and well, or is Marxism? I mean, if you look at uh, well, you know, in the, the the war, I mean, in the whole containment thing, George Kennan, the whole thing with Russia and then China and this great red amoeba coming out from the Eurasian landmass and containment, and the Mao was a communist and everything. And you look at China now and the leadership of China, you can't really call that in keeping, even though they use the dialectical materialism and whatnot to keep power, 
but you can't call it a communist. Can you call it a Marxist reality no. when you've got gated communities and the people are getting rich and all the traditional ways of forming capital favoring the few and so forth? No. Or is Marxism dead then? No, as an I, a well, grounding ideology. Well, and if it is, what takes its place in order to give underpinning to what you call the left? Well, I don't think Marxism is dead mm -hmm. um, uh, because Marxism was nothing more or less than I think the highest uh, appreciation of, of thought, philosophy, economics, uh, political science, uh, sociology, and it, as it had developed at the time that Marx was alive. Yeah. Um, I, we, we've learned a lot more since Marx. Marx yeah. would be the first to say that. Marx himself said, I'm not a Marxist. Did he? Um, sure. Oh. Uh, he wasn't a dogmatist, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, uh -huh. and, and neither uh -huh. are we. Yeah. Um, uh, so, no, I don't think uh, uh, a materialist understanding of the world as essentially a struggle between the haves and the have-nots yeah. uh, is dead because that's what's going on. It's still there. Uh, but still but with center. respect to yeah. China, yeah. Um, I don't know whether, whether you have this premise. Mm. I don't. I never thought that, that Mao uh, or the, uh, uh, the ideas of his party were particularly revolutionary. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they were for a, a block of classes, mm -hmm. unlike, say, the revolutionaries in Cuba mm -hmm. who took power. Um, there's four stars in the Chinese flag. Mm -hmm. uh, one is for the peasants, one's for the workers, one's for the uh, uh, upper middle class, and, and one's for the progressive bourgeoisie. Uh -huh. um, they, they were never uh, looking to construct socialism. They were looking for a, a class block. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so the evolution of China into what it exists today, which mm -hmm. is horrific, mm -hmm. um, is something that hasn't surprised me uh, because I wasn't disillusioned by it. I never had any illusions in Mao to begin with. Uh -huh. um, my uh, my uh, 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 admiration went more, say, to Che Guevara uh, and, the, uh, and the Castro leadership in Cuba, who were truly internationalists, mm -hmm. um, uh, who tried to encourage the spread of uh, anti-capitalist uh, movements around the world, which was not true of the leadership in China or Russia, for, the, for that matter. Um, and, okay. and uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. or at least yeah. it wasn't true of Russia mm. as the revolution matured and the leadership uh, changed and was mm. eliminated. Mm. It was initially, mm -hmm. but I think by certainly by the uh, late 20s and early 30s, uh, uh, they no longer had an internationalist uh, 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 position. You know, Michael that Ratner... Been fought out between Trotsky and Lenin and Stalin and that sort of thing. And, and, and huge social yeah. layers around yeah. each one. I yeah. Mean, you know, but it's all been built on the basis of Marxist interpretation. And as I say, one, one thing of that is from each according to their ability to teach according to their need. And it creates a state where the power is in the government. And it distrusts the institution of private property. All of those things were part of it, were they not? Yes. Or and, at least was and, the ideological and, basis upon which they and, came to and power. The, the revolutionaries that made the Ruff, Russian Revolution were pretty much eliminated by, by the purge trials. We know mm, that. Right. Um, but the nationalization of the resources was not eliminated. Mm -hmm. And you still had a non-capitalist economy, which was a tremendous engine for growth. That was eliminated starting in 1991. 91, and, and yeah. And then capitalism well, it, has they, been uh, restored well, yeah. to, to the Soviet Union. Well, that's, uh, it, that's what's uh, happened. It imploded in 1980. It was totally missed by our intelligence agency, the coming implosion of the Soviet Union. They didn't know they were, they were, they were they, you know, and that sort of thing. They, and it imploded. And now they've got a per cap, they've fallen apart. And now the per capita income of the Soviet Union is about comparable to Costa Rica. Terrible. I mean, uh, and it was one the challenge. Remember how challenged we were in '57 when that uh, that went up, yeah. and that they fought and defeated and suffered the Second World War yeah. in a socialist model, yeah. and they got housing yeah. and they did all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then they got Mr. Oliver Sacks with Sacks with his shock therapy to become capitalist, and now they've got the per capita income of Costa Rica. I should think China would try and hold on to dialectical materialism and the basis of a Marxist basis for organizing or, or uh, keeping their power base in. They wouldn't want to look over the shoulder at what's going on in Russia. It's the defeated third world country. That's right. Same, you know, you know what I'm saying? And that yeah. was the yeah. commies. Yeah. 
Yeah. That was the threat. Yeah. That was the left. But there's a whole the minds there's a whole privileged. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's a whole privileged uh, layer in in China now that's going to hold on no to its privileges, uh, uh, no matter. Yeah. And, and there's going to be a struggle between mm. the have-nots in China and the people that are making it now. Uh, just like we'd hoped in the Soviet Union, uh, we hoped that that nomenclature, that mm. bureaucracy, yeah. would be replaced and that they'd keep the nationalized industry, but they'd also restore democracy uh -huh. and a multi-party state and free speech and all that. Didn't happen. It happened. Didn't happen. It didn't happen. Why is an interesting question. Uh -huh. But but it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I th I think uh, with the power of modern advertising and TV uh, and propaganda, uh, people in the Soviet Union thought with capitalism comes a Chevrolet convertible, comes blue jeans, uh, and well, so on. Well, it did on. in this country. And, I mean, and, it, uh, yeah. and and there was nobody willing because they confused this this wretched bureaucracy that was. Uh, running their lives so mm -hmm. so fully and mm -hmm. poorly, mm -hmm. and they confused that with socialism, uh -huh. and they saw that the West was talking about capitalism, and capitalism meant this great abundance, and they saw the images on TV and the advertisements, well, and they didn't and they okay. didn't raise a finger uh -huh. to to stop the uh, privatization of all that was owned nationally in Russia, and now they're suffering from it. Well, okay, the, uh, okay, but is that the left? What is the left? There was now. What is the left? Now let's talk about it for a minute, because if you if you go and you say the institution, there's uh, workers of the world unite. You've got nothing to lose but your chains. Left. You've got a world to win. Other. And and the institution that was identified was the institution of private property ownership or a private sector, where you have a a private sector that operates like General Motors, Chevrolet, private sector, you know that sort of thing. And they did away with private property, right. as a, right. as, except but for But if cows but if if that if that private and that sector, didn't work. if that private sector is then uh, nationalized, and the individuals who own it are uh, paid off and sent packing, right. and all those resources are owned by the people as a whole, then they have to be democratically administered by people as a whole. But they and they can't be, be administered by a top, thin layer of bureaucracy uh, for its own interests, uh -huh. which were separate and opposed to the interests of the majority. And that's what happened in the Soviet Union. It's always Union. been that way throughout history, hasn't it? It's always been throughout history that there's been a few people that ran things from the top, emperors of Rome, the kings of the feudal period. Even in Periclean Greece, you had a few people. Most of the people were slaves. Alexander the Great, Tamar. It's been like that forever. And then you had to and, and then and now you've got a few people who own all the assets, a few bankers who own all the capitalists, the imperialists, set up a neo a neoliberal model in a low level or a neoconservative model, and it's still just a plutocratic few who own all the assets and everybody else Harold, is wallowing it, it, around in the mud like serfs. It doesn't have to be that way. No, that's the way it's And been. if you have well Malcolm X said said one time, uh, he said, I'm not gonna sit at the table with everybody eating dinner except me and call myself a diner. Yeah, right, but, right. Remember that? Right, yeah. But, yeah, and James but, Joyce said history is a nightmare from which I'm attempting to awaken. We haven't awakened yet. But if everybody's sitting around that table yeah. and everybody's got enough to eat, everybody's got more than enough to yeah. eat, uh -huh. and you've got a surplus, then you don't have those classes forming to try to keep what they have for themselves because you don't need it. Uh -huh. And if you have a possibility of a society of abundance, which we have we here. We have. We have. Yeah, but listen. That, uh, and and only, if it's democratically yeah. run, then uh -huh. you're not going to have the kind of nightmares that have developed uh, historically because there was never a surplus. Uh-huh. Uh, That's right. Well, yeah, but you see what a big dialectic shift that, or uh, uh, I don't know, existential or, or ontologic shift it is to going from where throughout all of human history, 200,000 years, there has been, in terms of a measurement, scarcity as a reality. There's only so much of that snake you can eat or whatever you can gather or that one fig you got off the tree. It was scarcity, and that was the context. And it's changed perhaps in the, just in the modern experience. We may have transcended with our design, our capability, and a balanced private sector, public sector thing that we developed here and so forth, some tension between those two and everything like that. But we may have transcended scarcity in terms of our collective capability of providing yeah. for humanity but nobody ever 
says that is the case no politician ever says that there has been some qualitative change in terms of our well, capability of transcending scarcity because it would threaten all of our institutions which were formulated historically out of a condition of scarcity that's been transcended. Yeah. And we have no vision of that yeah. anywhere yeah. being voiced by anybody. You ever hear anybody say anything except wage slavery as a way of distributing income and so forth? Yeah. There's no vision. Yeah. No, I think what you've just said is very, very profound and shows someone who's thought long and hard about how things have evolved. I, I think what you said is exactly, exactly what obtains. Mm. Uh, and our only hope mm. is, is that we can take control of the resources of this planet uh, before there's no more planet. Well, what, the that's polar a... ice caps are melting, <laughs> you know. Uh, we're running out of time. Yeah. Uh, we I have we have the resources to you. do it. I completely agree. It is an existential. We've been here 200,000 years, 10,000 generations, a Homo sapien sapien. Throughout all of that time, it's probably somebody with a club. It would be hitting people and, ma and you know it's just been like mafia dons. Mo and the people have never counted. They've been slaves and slaves. And now you got you got a new situation that's called for in these very times, and it is. You know, qualitatively, something's really big blowing it. And you know, it was around 1970 that we finally crossed the line where the weapons that are part of our extended consciousness became so sophisticated, became so clever, that we could know that if they were unleashed, it could now finally mean the end of the whole species. Yeah. Not the other nation, not the other tribe. Wipe the whole thing. It's an existential event in the evolution of events. Yeah. Something on the other side would be like transcending scarcity, material scarcity, as an as an ontologic or some other word, a, a new reality, not like biblical or, or some idea of God or something, but a new reality that is qualitatively different than the historical context out of which we're emerging and in which all our institutions are predicated. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, that that's, that, yeah. that that you have tremendous uh, possibilities. But on the other hand, you've got the threat, not of just of, of uh, nuclear, uh, thermonuclear weapons, but the ecological threat. You know, one of the, yeah. one of the, one of the, the great crimes mm -hmm. of the Bush administration mm -hmm. was having this attorney from the American Petroleum Society yeah. editing the scientific papers that would then be put on Bush's desk. Yes. And, and taking out <coughs> any mention of uh, global warming. Yeah, right. You know? Yeah. And the man is ignorant enough as it is, yeah. and he's got this oil lawyer mm -hmm. uh, censoring scientific papers yeah. so that he remains ignorant, yeah. and the uh, polar ice caps you know, melt irreversibly. Yeah, they irreversibly are. They now. really are, yeah. You know? They really are. They and got I live sea roots now through the Arctic Sea. Did you see that in the Times the other day? No. They had a, yeah, the sea roots are opening through the Arctic Ocean now. Yeah. It's opening up new What explorers had looked for for years. Yeah, they, they, they found a mastodon do. again that had been frozen in the permafrost for thousands of <laughs> years. And <laughs> it, you know, yeah, it is. It really is the global warming. And they, they still yeah. say the science isn't in. You know, the science isn't in on the fact that there's some contribution to, to uh, human activity to global warming, and they won't address it at all. It's almost absurd in terms of the stance in which well, this it's, group it's, has. It's, it's, what, it's, what, it's how it's the like capitalists live. The absurd, yeah. It's how they live. Mm -hmm. uh, they live only in, in the short run. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember the famous quote from John Maynard Keynes, well, uh, in the long run, we're all dead. Yeah. They don't think in the long run. Mm -hmm. They think only of profits, only of immediate profits, mm -hmm. and satisfying their shareholders. Mm -hmm. And there's no possibility under their system mm -hmm. of short-term profits of any kind of long-term planning. Right. Oh, and as yeah. a consequence, yeah. you get what we have. Yeah, and, and it's, almost like a re it's almost like a religion, this market fundamentalism, and everything can be done by the market. I mean, everything can be done there. They're going to vitiate any kind of, uh, you know, uh, civil liberties, all these kind of things that are government intervention into the thing. Where they would have liked to have gutted Social Security if they could have. Apparently they can in this country. But the, th but the thing has changed. It's a very uh, crucial and challenging kind of uh, time right now, and it's, it's very challenging. Are you optimistic, pessimistic, or how do you feel about things nationally and in the world scale, and where is the vision going to come from, I, I was t uh, sort of asking, is the Marxist critique still, or left, relevant to the realities that are emerging in the world? 
or is there something else needed that hasn't yet a born yet that is coming i lack for leaders that prevent present leadership uh, or, or, or even intellectual leadership in terms of how are we going to get a hold of this thing and get direction for moving forward i i don't know how do you feel well, who are our sources you say chavez am, and am i am i I have a certain optimism of the spirit, or yeah. otherwise, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the kind of stuff I do. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, a year ago, uh, Michael Ratner from the Center for Constitutional Rights, yeah, and great. Heidi Bogosian yeah. from the National Lawyers Guild, right, right. and Dahlia Hashad, mm -hmm. who's the Arab uh, Muslim coordinator for the ACLU to do mm -hmm. their outreach, and, yeah. and I uh -huh. started a radio program. Right. We're on a BAI at 10 o'clock in the morning on Mondays after Amy. Good. It's called Law and Disorder. Okay. And uh, Good. we're trying to educate people on the horrible assault on civil rights and democratic rights. I know it's uh, that the Bush administration right. has launched. All right, good. Uh, that's one of the things. Well, that's you good. Know, that's that, how long do it run? Doing the Kunstler book yeah. was, was another yeah. another my my optimistic will. Right. <laughs> um, you know. You don't feel so demoralized or frustrated if you try to do something. Right, right. Um, okay. What's the outcome going to be? Yeah. If enough of enough of us, mm -hmm. you and I, and, yeah. and the people that listen to this program, yeah. agree with us, uh -huh. and I think there's a lot of New Yorkers who do. Oh, yeah. Uh, I but think I think the majority of people yeah. in this country uh -huh. don't like either the Republicans or the Democrats, and would like to see an alternative leadership. Uh -huh. um, and and I think that if we continue. Um, it might have worked. We could pull it out. Uh -huh. To not do anything uh -huh. is, is to concede defeat, and I think that certainly would lead to a horrible world. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, you know, look at the kind of leadership they're providing. Mm. There was an, uh, an interview with an intelligence interrogator from Iraq that mm -hmm. I heard on mm -hmm. Amy Goodman's show yesterday, mm -hmm. and the guy was talking very matter-of-factly uh. about how there was a warehouse where there are 500 dead bodies stacked up and his job was to go there and try to get retinal scans uh, mm -hmm. so they could identify these people mm -hmm. and look for any kind of intelligence in their pockets and yeah. see how many were armed mm -hmm. and he went on to say that uh, uh, about 20 10 20 percent of them were armed mm -hmm. that most of them were old men mm -hmm. or women or children mm -hmm. uh, they had all been killed in the battle of Fallujah and he was talking in the same I way know, yeah. that these guards at the yeah. Nazi concentration yeah, camps right, were talking, right, right, you know, right, 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 you know, right, just kind of right. impassively. And they used phosphorus uh, there, uh, white phosphorus, I yes, think. Yes, they yeah. did. It's chemical warfare. Yeah, yeah. they did. They yeah, had finally well, admitted it today. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, for us not to fight back mm -hmm. and to turn the world over to these monsters mm. uh, or these ignoramuses, mm -hmm. Um, uh, is not uh, it's not an option. Well, a for lot us. of people in the country though, are going to think it. Uh, you just sort of lumped them together, Republicans or something. A lot of people are thinking, well, they're so absurd, now. And, and it's all 38 percent approval. That's what I think Johnson and I would have decided. Only 42 percent of them uh, don't think he's a liar. <laughs> yes, right. You know, <laughs> but American I mean, people aren't stupid. They're manipulated, yeah, absolutely. and they don't have a lot of yeah, information. I know. They don't have a lot of tools to okay, work with, right. but they're not stupid. No, they're not, and stupid, they're not unkind. But they are easy to manipulate with fear. And fear is the thing by which you manipulate people. It was the beginning theme of this program. Yes, it was uh, indeed, and it's and, still there. It's probably it, been there since Genghis Khan's yeah, day. But and, yeah, it works. And, and, and it can be manipulated at the level of psychology. Vance Packard, hidden persuaders, reptilian core fears. You can manipulate, and they're well. Doing it goes it. hand in hand with yeah. ignorance. Yeah. You know, and if you only get your news mm -hmm. uh, from Fox, mm -hmm. you're going to be easily manipulated. Not only Fox, but from the networks. I mean, you know, in a very real sense, of because course. there are people that self-censor in order to fit into a thing, in order to keep a job and a career and access. Yeah. Look what they do to get access to somebody is in that power structure that might give them the insight to something they have to have. Yeah. You know, the whole thing with the plane thing and all of that yeah. is going. But most of the people we're reviewing would say, well, they've gone so far, let's say the Republicans, and they will say, well, then the Democrats are going to be able to have a chance to win finally, you see? So that the, ha the, the, the chances in that the Democrats will be the recipients of the reaction against the ineptitude of things now. And I tell you, and Harold. And everything's going to be okay when the Democrats get in because they'll yeah. be the good guys. The good guys are going to win out over the bad guys and that kind of thing. That's been going on a long time. You don't think that don't, I, I don't think. You need something radical. I don't. Well, you need. What do you think? I do think, you, I do think you need something uh, radical. I okay. think you need something different. Mm -hmm. I think falling into the trap 
of uh, thinking the Democrats are, are, are a the viable yeah. and positive alternative to the Republicans uh, is a mistake. Uh -huh. uh, I voted for Lyndon Johnson in 64. It's the first yeah. time I voted yeah. uh, because Goldwater seems scarier, so yeah. uh, people One voted for you know, and, uh, and Johnson was, was the peace candidate. Yeah. And uh, Goldwater uh, was the hawk. Yeah. And when Johnson got elected, he escalated the war in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. And I got burned. And I haven't voted for a Democrat since. Uh -huh. because. Well, who do you vote for? When you can't vote for a Democrat, you can vote for a Republican. You can vote for NATO. I, I, I vote. Well, what do you vote for? Who I, do you vote I, for? Do what, I do what Eugene, Party, what Eugene Debs said. What did Eugene He said, I'd say? rather vote for something I want and not get it than vote for something I don't want and get yeah, it. Yeah, but we've been doing and, that for and, a long and, time. And, and, I, and I try to uh, find an individual or a party that agrees pretty much with me Where? and I vote for him. But I tell you, voting is well, not, not, not even, voting, Harold, yeah. isn't, isn't, isn't the be all and end all. No, that's true. Organizing is, yeah. self-organizing mm -hmm. is, getting together with like-minded people. Mm -hmm. um, th we're only going to free ourselves to the extent that we do it ourselves. Yeah. And, and there's no great leader that's going to come down from, from, you know. from anywhere uh -huh. uh, and and do it. Uh -huh. uh, it's only going to be a consequence of what we do ourselves. All right. The American Revolution was made by people that picked up guns and fought the British That's and kicked right. them out. Yeah. It wasn't uh, uh, people waiting for some kind of leader to be voted in. Right. And this country is going to change only to the extent that its citizens get involved in protecting themselves and advancing their own interests uh -huh. and not looking to some savior from one of the big capitalist well, parties. Okay, yeah, okay, 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 yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. Uh, well, we might be able to get some, I wish we had a few Voltaire's or a few John Stuart Mills or visionaries around that could help give some sort of a, a, a jump start to that kind of thing because these are really, uh, truly strict, tricky times. But um, uh, let's keep the hope alive, as Mr. Uh, uh, you know, as Reverend, the good Reverend says, and so forth. And I'm sorry, one of the things that we're almost running right out of time. So thank well, you. Your program certainly keeps it alive. Well, this has know, been a I real enjoyable you, conversation. Well, I enjoyed talking I appreciate to you too, coming but out we're here. fellow travelers, as it were, along the line of trying to help the poor and disadvantaged of the world. I don't like the trends in the world. It seems to me it's all gated communities. Things are very concentrated to half the population starving it still is always has been and there's no vision I can see that is going to be able to effectively address the operation of this interrelated spaceship earth and so I, I wish it would emerge out of our intellectual class that program that you're doing is on BAI every day is that no no on Monday? Mondays every, every Monday did you ever think of trying to segue you guys Michael and those people ever try and think of segueing into television Television and the world is rapidly going multimedia. Have you ever thought of trying to get into television in order to spread it? You know, uh, uh, you're on radio. Uh, that's what yeah. I'm saying. Have you ever well, thought of television as a way of reaching out? Because they're going to be putting multimedia on cell phones soon. You know, see? <laughs> um, you're more high tech than I am. No, I hadn't thought about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's maybe a, you could. It's a very good idea. Yeah. Um, we should get some uh, of you over here, maybe. Public access. It's here. You could come here. It's television. You get the thing. You get a, you get a thing and get a slot and get it onto television. And it gets streamed to the internet because, yeah, you know, see, I mean, it's just a thought. That's we would love to have you here. See, That's that, what I'm saying in public access and uh, follow along with Amy and public access. You know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I think. I mean, good people. I think that TV is probably even more effective than radio because it's. It's a whole different it's, medium. It's two-dimensional. Yeah. Um, and, and I think to the extent that we can build alternative media, uh, like you're, you've been, you're a pioneer. Uh, Thirty-five uh, years have been at it. And, and Amy Sisyphus. just recently, and us yeah. just even more recently. Yeah. Um, I think that that's going to be a tremendous help in building David. the new yeah. movement. And thanks for that. And Michael Ratner, the Center for Con Mr. Weiss, everybody, the Constitutional uh, Center, and everything. Keep up the fight because it's still, you know. It, but it's it's a very challenging time. I really thank you for all the work, and uh, let this be the beginning of a wonderful friendship. Well, thanks, Harold. It was it's real nice to be on your, your show. Your pleasure to have had the, his perceptions. We invite you to, and we'll come back again tomorrow. That's it for now. But again, I think it'd be a good idea to. Uh, you know, see if you couldn't, uh, you, uh, Mike, and give the best to Michael Rasner, everybody at the Center for Constitutional Rights. I'll Rights. be talking to Michael tomorrow. Say hello. And I'll, give I'll his best. Uh, there's legislation, John McCain, and I appreciate it.